Alex, it's great to have you with us. Uh, Lay it out for us. Where are you telling your companies that there is opportunity? What do they have to do to take advantage of this moment? Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, undeniably, this is a really difficult time for a lot of companies and our, our feeling is it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. But history has taught us that if you make the right kind of decisive business decisions during a downturn, you can actually emerge from the crisis as a stronger business. The last several years have made capital incredibly cheap for companies, and it's led to a lot of a lot of bloat, a lot of unnecessary projects, a lot of overhiring, as you heard. With even Amazon is not immune to this, and so um, if CEOs can see this coming, can see what's going to happen ahead of time, they can take corrective action, and uh, they actually are able to create the unit economic formula that produces cash flows. They can uh, revise a lot of their assumptions on talent. Um, you know, hiring, it will right. be a lot easier in this market now and a bunch, a bunch of other activities that we think will be good corrective actions. They'll produce a better business in the long term. Alex, you talk a lot about corrective actions, but even in public markets, we're seeing companies that have actually seen this coming or taken the steps way ahead of time. We had Tony Shu from DoorDash on as well as Sarah Fryer at Nextdoor. They either raised enough money or they got their unit economics sorted out well ahead of this moment they're able to keep investing for the long term and keep that plan intact. Could you argue that this is too late for companies to be looking at some of the stuff you just laid out? It's not too late. I think you're getting into the difference between public companies and private companies. You know, when we work, we work mostly with private companies that hopefully someday go public. And when you're public, you're being measured every single day. But when you're private, there's still quite a bit of overhang from 2021. We had you know, record amounts of venture capital, both of the early and growth stage coming into the industry, setting very, very high watermarks. And a lot of companies are actually quite flush with cash, but they, don't, they haven't yet seen the correction in, in their stock price. So unlike a public company where they've had to get that in, in shape earlier, a lot of private companies are still coming around to the reality. Alex, I wonder how you're advising uh, others on hiring, because we've seen some disparity in the ways in, in which HR is approaching the future, right? Uh, Uber and some others, Meta, for example, are getting more disciplined. Others, like Google at least, told uh, Deirdre last week that they feel comfortable where they are. Do some have better radars than others? Um, what, what, should, what is the right path right now in terms of headcount? Well, I think in the difference between Google and Uber is one company that's trying to get to cash flow positive and the other company that's wildly profitable. So, so I think they can have different sets of assumptions around how much they want to tighten the belt on hiring. But look, I, I think that the, the, the message everyone's getting right now is that you need to become default alive in this environment, that you should be able at any point in time to pull back your sales, pull back your marketing and get to a pretty close to break even in your business because we don't know how long the capital markets are essentially going to be inaccessible for all but the very best companies in the private markets. And so this is a question of building a margin of safety into your business. And the only way to do that is to essentially look at your organization and say, what's necessary, what's, what's not totally necessary to the core of the value proposition, and then rationalizing that appropriately. But Alex, let's try to make this investable. I mean, we are in this situation. The S&P is down two and a half percent. The Nasdaq down more than that. The Dow is down more than 700 points today at this point. And, and so I wonder, when we're looking at the upside of a downturn, what what sort of factors do investors need to pay attention to to make sure they're not caught on the back foot like Amazon, Walmart and Target were when it comes to hiring and inventories? I mean, they're also being careful not to raise prices too much because they're concerned about competition. So to what degree does competitive advantage play into this? And how should investors think about competitive advantage uh, in this market and, and how uh, companies can demonstrate that? That's a great question. So the way we think of competitive advantage is, is there a core flywheel in your business that is generating value and how can you make that flywheel spin faster? And you can do that in a downturn also. In, in some ways, it's, it's, it's actually easier because if you're in a highly competitive market, like take, for example, the quick commerce category in the US, where you have tons of companies spending hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire users and incentivize them to retain, a lot of that money is going to go away. And so what you're going to find is a lot of companies retrenching into the parts of the market where they do have network effects, where they do have defensibility, fortifying those defenses as opposed to fighting battles on new fronts. So we're encouraging companies to look at their business at a really granular level and say, what's worth defending? What's worth backing away from? Take your resources that are limited 
and reinvest them in securing the core of your business because when growth comes back, you'll be able to reinvest in that. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of the game theory of saying, yeah. you know, where, where do people feel strongest? Where do they feel weakest? And we believe people are going to retrench through their strengths.